Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 102nd episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include former NATO commander Wesley K. Clark, who's featured in the documentary Hot Money. We'll also visit with his son, Wesley Clark Jr. We'll also visit with actor Courtney Gaines, the star of Back to the Future, Can't Buy Me Love, Children of the Corn, and more. He is uh, going to be talking about the new film, Queen Bees. We'll also visit with friend of the show, new artist Bly. Got a brand new single, Drunk Dial, that drops tomorrow. If you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Now, it's a new month and we've got America's birthday coming up on Sunday, but here are a few more things to look forward to in July. Number one, lots of sports. The NBA Finals start a week from today. Another UFC rematch for Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier is set for July 10th. The ESPY Awards are the same night. Baseball's All-Star Game is July 13th. And the Summer Olympics finally get started July 23rd. A few big movies are on the way. Black Widow hits theaters and Disney Plus next Friday. Space Jam A New Legacy with LeBron James lands July 16th. And Disney's Jungle Cruise movie comes out July 30th. On TV, Big Brother and Love Island return next Wednesday. The Monsters, Inc. series, Monsters at Work, hits Disney Plus the same day. The new Gossip Girl reboot arrives on HBO Max July 8th. And Shark Week starts July 11th. And finally, talking about the holidays, the big one is the 4th of July this Sunday. But there's a few more that you might want to mark on your calendar. Like tomorrow is World UFO Day. National Bikini Day is the 5th. Fried Chicken Day is the 6th. Pina Colada Day is the 10th, followed by Bojito Day on the 11th. National French Fry Day is the 13th. Ice Cream Day is the 18th. Junk Food Day is the 21st. And National Tequila Day is July 24th. We've talked about the documentary Hot Money before, had the opportunity to talk with former NATO commander Wesley Clark and Wesley Clark Jr. as well with us today. And first, Wesley and Wesley Jr., thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Cameron. Now, tell us a little bit about Hot Money. I know that uh, this is actually available. uh, I'm an Amazon Prime member, so I'm excited, going to have the chance to watch this one for free. And uh, and tell us, first off, uh, Commander Clark, what it's like to uh, to see the feedback that's coming from the from the film. Oh, we're getting good feedback from it. And, um, you know, this is about the financial system. This is about how we're all connected to climate change, even if it We don't see it today or tomorrow. We're not hit by a storm or flooding. And yet, um, through the financial system, through mortgages, through derivatives, um, the risk is spread and the risk is growing and it affects all of us. What do you think is the biggest misconception about climate change and its correlation with the financial markets as well? Well, I'll let Wes Jr. talk about that. (laughs) Well, I I think the biggest misconception is that we will have the money and time to address it. And what the film lays out is, look, capital is like a lot of capital is its potential, right? So right now we have more capital than we've ever had. And that's capital that can be used to, you know, switch to renewable energy, used to harden our infrastructure, used to prepare us for the changes that are coming in the climate. But once this hits full force, and we are very close to that happening, all that capital will wind up evaporating before we've ever even used it as asset values go down. So it's important that we spend the money and we spend the resources to address it now because it will not be there when we need it. What is the response that folks are giving? Are, are they surprised by the, the state of situation that we're in right now? No, people see it, but they don't take action on it. Mm. So what we're trying to do is reach a different audience. All the smart people understand this and <laughs> these universities and everything, at least they consider themselves smart people. And they, so they all get it. And what we're trying to do is bring some of their analysis out to ordinary people who don't have a chance to listen to these people because Truth is that unless popular opinion demands action, there won't be action. The the thing about democracy is we're, you know, we don't have to kowtow to the government. 
Mm. We mostly are free to do everything we want. And we go in a, you know, 330 million different directions. It's only when there's a catastrophe that we come together. And to deal with climate change, we have to be able to foresee the future catastrophe and come together now to deal with it and prevent it. So this is a tough problem for democracy. And Wes Jr., for you, what can we do on an individual basis? I mean, is that what it's going to take for us to make the change, each of us making a change in our own personal lives as well? Actually, not really. That was that was something that was the whole, like, what's your personal carbon footprint? <laughs> that was something that was developed by think tanks funded by oil companies to try and put the blame on individuals as opposed to systemic problems. Uh, is it going to require change from all of us? Yeah, but the average person can't control how much plastic is used in their packaging. They can't control how they heat their home or cool their home or their choice of electricity. People don't have those choices. Those are systemic choices that are determined essentially by our you know, legal system and financial system. Wesley, how hard is it going to be to make an adjustment to make the changes that we need to make? And, and how much is that going to affect our day-to-day activities? Well, it's very hard to make these changes because <clears throat> the um, economic power drives politics. And economic power is anchored in oil, gas, big utilities that use coal-fired power plants or uh, gas-fired power plants. And so, um, and these are good people in here. They're they're just trying to help the country Mm -hmm. and do their own business. But they fight for their own interests in Congress. They resist the passage of laws that would move the society and its economy in a different direction. So it's only when the entire public comes to recognize a problem that you can work against these very powerful economic forces. And I know we talked about this before, but to have uh, the the voice of Jeff Bridges to be a part of this and uh, really going full bore involved in this one as well, what does that say to you about how Hollywood or, or maybe that side of things sees the problem that we've got to face here in the near future? Well, Jeff saw the problem firsthand because his house was blown or was washed away in a mudslide in Santa Barbara. So, but, but in general, Hollywood sees the problem. Look, they're not connected to it economically, except maybe some investments in oil and mm-hmm. gas or something like this. It's not their livelihood. But when you're connected to this economically and people are telling you your industry is causing profound problems, boy, it's hard to get out of that. And, um, and, and that's our problem. Lots of talk, not much action. That's right. And again, uh, Wes Jr., I always want to make sure and let our listeners know, like I said, uh, Amazon Prime members have a special right now where folks can find more information about the documentary and, uh, and everything you've got going social-wise as well. Sure. They can watch it for free on Amazon Prime. So Hot Money is free on Amazon Prime. 70% of Americans are members of Amazon. So you can all watch it. Also, DVDs are available at your local library. All right. Well, uh, Wesley Clark and Wesley Clark Jr., great to visit with you guys. Check out the documentary Hot Money. And guys, hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Cameron. Hope you have one, too. Something called the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council says that we'll eat 150 million hot dogs on July 4th, making it the top hot dog eating day of the year. Now, they did a new poll and asked people to name the best drinks to pair with a hot dog. And 1 in 11 Americans must be fancier than I am because 9% said wine pairs well with them. Now, soda was number one, with 76% of people agreeing it goes well with hot dogs. That's followed by beer, 57%. Lemonade, 54%. Iced tea, 48%. Orange juice, 12% milk, 9%, and wine, also 9%. They also looked at America's most loved regional hot dog styles, and New York style is number one. That's an all-beef dog topped with steamed onions and deli-style mustard. Of course, bonus points if you buy them from a street vendor who's yelling at a cab driver, am I right? Now, second on the list is Chicago style with mustard, relish, onions, peppers, tomatoes, a pickle, and celery salt, all jammed into a poppy seed bun. 
And third on the list is Detroit-style Coney Dogs, topped with mustard, onions, and chili. The Hot Dog and Sausage Council's website has a list with another 15 regional-style dogs you can check out as well. Excited to talk uh, this afternoon with actor, and he's also a musician, I found out a little while ago. Courtney Gaines with us today, and first off, Courtney, I truly appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. No problem, but who are you calling special? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, Courtney, I know one of the things that that I noticed whenever I got the press release was uh, 30 years in the industry you're celebrating. And uh, how unbelievable is that for you to even take that in? Yeah, 30, yeah, 35 or something at this point. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you look back, right? It's like, uh, where did all the time go, as they say, you know? (laughs) That's why it's funny when, you know, of course, everyone wants to talk about, you know, Children of the Corn, and I understand that. But sometimes, you know, people ask me questions or this and that. And I'm like, man, that was like 30 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> what is the one for you that sticks out as one of the roles that you that you really hang on to? And that you're like, if I want to be defined by one thing, I want to be defined Ooh, by that one. I want to be defined by one role. Ooh. <laughs> Probably not Children of the Corn, but that is the one I am defined by. It. And, I, and I, like I said, I understand uh, to, to some degree, I understand. But let's see, what, what, what one would I want? to be defined by yikes i don't know that's a really good question no one's actually asked that question before i like it i like it um i don't know i don't know uh yeah the one that one that comes to mind is just a role on uh, recently that you know fairly recently that i did was i did a really good guest star on criminal minds mm-hmm. um where I, where I play the character that he thinks the, uh, the, uh, whatever well, the name for the bad guy, the ad, the sub, the, uh, sub, ad, sub. yeah, the unsub, <laughs> but it turns out I'm not the unsub, but I play this really homeless, mentally challenged character yet he's protecting, you know, someone else. And it's a, that was a really challenging role. That was one of the few role guest stars I've ever been just offered. I guess they, they figured it was a really challenging role. They needed someone who could probably figure it out. But I remember I, when we went to the table read, I, I got there early so I could meet the director and I said, I don't understand this. <laughs> and I never do something. I, I said, can you help me? He's like, let's go talk to the executive producer writer. <laughs> so we went to him. I said, I don't understand this. And he, and even he who wrote it could not really break it down for me. It was wow. that complicated, but he gave me in some insights, but not really like all of them. And, uh, but they gave me plenty of time. They, they were very clever how they, they left all the good stuff in the interrogation for the end, which so gave me a week to really work on the character. And they did something that no one's ever done in television before, which was say, how would you like to shoot this? And in what order? Like, it's going to be you all day. How would you like to do this? And that was actually really, actually good because it was a particular scene I wanted to have a chance to have a discussion about that was later in the day uh, for the arc and it really made a big difference. But in television, they usually just walk you on set and go walk here, sit here. And if you manage to spit your lines out without screwing up, they're moving on. You know, (laughs) you have to shoot an hour episode in a week, you know, they have to really move. Um, So that was a pretty, pretty great experience as far as acting chops go. So I'll, I'll, I'll go with that for now. There you go. Now, now how much different is the process of getting into character on a, like you said, on a television show, as opposed to coming on a movie set. I mean, how much different is trying to get in that role? It all comes down to time. Right. And, and that's, that's the, uh, the advantage that a, a movie star gets, they might have six months to prepare a character, three months to prepare a character. I tell people, you give me six months, I'll do it in Chinese for you. You know what I mean? It's like that. I've never had that level of luxury. Um, a lo- the, if you're lucky on a, on a, you know, on a film, if you have a month, like you can really do a lot of prep in a month. Um, sometimes you have that, sometimes you don't. It seems like nowadays, it seems like less and less time. But television, it's a very quick turnaround. If you come in, you audition. So you have less than 24 hours to prepare a character for an audition for a cold reading. So that's very difficult in itself. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky enough to then get the job, it's usually within a week. Wow. And then you're shooting for at tops if it's a big guest star a week and you're moving very fast. So it's you have to 
you don't have a lot of time to explore. You kind of got to go with your big guns. You know, you got to go with what you know works. And uh, so the bigger the film are, even if you're lucky enough to do some theater and have, you know, several weeks of rehearsal, you have much more time to experiment, much more time to explore. And that an actor loves that luxury if you can have it. But but television is usually not that arena. Now, we, we've talked about over your career, some of the different movies that you've been in. Uh, what, the, the one I go back to... I, I, I saw Children of the Corn once. I tried to forget everything about it. It <laughs> gave me nightmares forever. So so that's not my character. I, I stick you with the burbs. I stick yeah. you with the burbs. That's where I stick you at. Well, that's my, uh, you know, in terms of doing conventions and things, uh, the number two, the number two seller is the burbs because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's horror, but it's like, you know, comedy. But the people that like horror love it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I really did not know the level of occult following it had till I started doing conventions. It has a really really loyal fan base of people who love that movie mm-hmm. so it's it, that's been a nice surprise to know and you've worked with some amazing actors and actresses over the your career as well and i tell you the the one out now queen bees yeah. you'd be hard pressed to find a, a better a list would you no you're you're absolutely right and uh uh Michael Lembeck, the director, I, I took a comedy class that his father started years ago, the Harvey Lembeck Comedy Workshop, that him, Michael, and his sister Helene still teach. And when I heard that he was doing this project, I, you know, I reached out and said, "Hey, you, know, you got anything?" And, and you know, he didn't have a, he, it was a cameo essentially. But when I was told I could work with mm-hmm. Anne Margaret, Ellen Bernstein, Loretta Devine, and Jane Curtin, I'm like, "I'm in. Let's do this." <laughs> And it's been, I've been pleasantly surprised that my scene made the trailer. You know, sometimes it's, you have a small scene, you might not even make the movies, much less make the trailer. So that's been a, a pleasant surprise. And it was, it was a joy to get to work with those ladies. Queen Bee's out now. Where's, uh, where can folks find more info on that while we're, while it we're talking? It is. It's been out now for, uh, I think this weekend will, or this Friday will make two weeks. Uh, it, you can find it in theaters. It's in quite a few theaters and it's also on VOD. So it's, it's, it's really available and it, uh, uh, it's doing pretty well out there. So that's, that's great. Now, Courtney, this, this last year, has it made you appreciate some of the theatrical releases that you've had and the big opportunities to be out with the crowds? And it has, has it made you look forward to those opportunities coming up again as things open up? Well, yeah, I think that, I think for everybody, it, it's changed our perspective a little bit. I'm not a, you know, red carpets are fun on one hand, but they're also like, strange and awkward and weird you know you stand on this carpet and all these people are you know with their cameras are asking you to look directly at them all at the same time because they want a shot where you look and the shots are always garbage anyway right? it's like it's not like lit well and but you're always going like there's all this flash and it just seems really weird and stupid you know and it's terrifying you know at a premiere with all these people seeing your movie for the first time if you if often is the case i haven't had a chance to see it either so it's the first time it's always a terrifying and overwhelming experience but yet at the same time obviously the whole thing's a a buzz right it's like it's like Mm -hmm. a crazy buzz experience so so yeah it'll be fun to see something with an audience again that that would be be great and uh, do a carpet again it's been a while but uh, what's great is, you know, uh, oddly enough, all these movies, la- th- 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 there was a backlog of these films that I've done. And I guess maybe because of COVID, nothing came out last year. And all of a sudden, they're all coming out back to back. And ironically, most of them were picked up by Gravitas Ventures. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones putting them out theatrically and on VOD. So we've got Queen Bees, which is out now. Mm-hmm. The second movie is a little indie film I did during the pandemic called River. It was a very, like, only five people in the in the project. And it's got sci-fi undertones but it's not like cgi and in space and uh uh, that's and that's coming out in july 13th Mm -hmm. and then i just found out a movie i did before even queen bees called charming the hearts of men is coming out august 13th and again all all theatricals all vod at the same time all gravitas ventures so god bless them for picking up my films and putting them out and, uh, and then I just found out another movie I was in uh, called Await the Dawn, which I knew had been out in Europe, a horror film, just got on Amazon Prime this week. And so that's that's out as well. So all of a sudden, it's just like all these projects that have been like, <laughs> what happened to them, which often happens when you do indie films, are just all coming out at the same time. So Now, how do you see the VOD, the on-demand and all that moving forward? How do you see that affecting theatrical releases? Do you, do you think once once everything's back open, it's back to normal, you think? 
I don't think so. I think that this has changed everybody. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, people don't even, you know, people, there are a lot of people now who don't have to go into an office anymore, you know, and, and they can move anywhere they want. And that's, that, there's some, there's some great things about that. I, I'm not saying theaters are going to die, but I think this, I think they've taken a big hit obviously. And some of the other big chains are already buying up other chains that's already going on. But I think with home entertainment, you know, you can buy these insanely giant screens now. You might as well be in a theater and, and see it at the, in the comfort of your own home. All you got to do is just, you know, click and boom, you're there for a couple bucks, maybe even cheaper than going to the movies. And certainly the popcorn prices are ridiculous. <laughs> the highest markup in food history, I think, is popcorn. That's what I think you're right. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's I think it's going to affect it. I think it's I think the best way to really compare the whole thing is what happened to the record industry, you know, when the CD died, you know, I think, I think every, when every, every time everything goes digital, I think it greatly affects, you know, the physical world like CDs are going to a movie theater, you know, for that matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if in, in, or even buying a DVD, right. And you can actually buy the film on VOD if you want to keep it forever, so to speak. So, you know, if you want to see it once you can do that, or you can have it. And so there, I just think there's going to be more and more of that going on. I think it already has. And I think you, you're already seeing it with the, um, you know, when you look at the Hulus and the Netflix, I mean, that's essentially what the record industry had to do was, was start buying up all the catalogs. It all became about having giant catalogs and you're getting your movies out through commercials, films, television. And that's how young audiences are finding out about bands, you know, and that's how that's worked. I think now you're going to see this. You're seeing the same thing happening. And I think, you know, Disney was the first one to really figure it out with Disney Plus where they're like, OK, we're not giving you our movies anymore, Hulu and Netflix. And, and not only that, we're going to go buy Fox and we're going to own Star Wars. <laughs> Beat that, suckers. And, you know, so you want to go, you want to see Star Wars? You know, if you don't own the DVD, you got to go through Disney Plus now, you know? So they're buying up, they're, you know, two, I mean, Disney and Fox, I mean, that's two giant catalogs. That's two out of the top five, right? So you might see that happen again, you know, Paramount's doing Paramount Plus, but I could see Paramount getting bought out eventually by one of the other big ones like universal or something. So I think it's going to become the catalog game, you know, so that again, the money is going to be that anybody can find, you know, just tons and tons of movies and catalog that they want to just press a couple of buttons and bang, there it is in their home. You know, now you, you also mentioned CDs and uh, you got the guitars hanging behind you as, has this last year as a musician, as a, as a writer, has it been adverse on your writing or has it been beneficial on your writing? Um, it, it only really caused me to write one song, which is which is out now in my band Ripple Street called The Great Divide that you can find on Spotify and all those things. But you can also see the the music video on uh, YouTube. And that was just really I felt like in this last year, you know, everybody just went off the freaking rails politically. <laughs> just went nuts. And we're constantly spewing their their opines, you know, and I try to keep my, you know. I don't know. My per I, don't, I don't really want to get into my personal life too much as an actor. It's like, let's talk about acting. You know, or you want to talk about my, you know, want to think ph philosophically, but like, you know, politics, you know, that's, you know, religion, those are dangerous subjects, you know, and I understand that. Um, but people went nuts. And so I just felt like I needed to, what I do is I, I do what I do. I, I created a artistic response. And so the song is just really about in the video, you're seeing, you know, Black Lives Matters protests as long as you're seeing Trump rallies, because all of that was happening. It was this perfect storm um, and, and not picking a side, but pointing out that we're sort of being put in positions to pick sides. Like one of the lyrics is, you know, you have to be for the second or you have to be for gun control. No, you don't. You know, that's that's what we get presented. You have to be on the right or on the left. No, you don't. I mean, I, you know, I understand people want, you know, the Second Amendment and people want to have the right to have guns. But I, but at the same time, I'm like, do we have to have machine guns in the city? No, I don't know if I'm with that. And if <laughs> I say I want that, that doesn't mean I'm against the Second Amendment. That's you putting words in my mouth. I didn't say that. I just said, I don't know that we need submachine guns, you know, that were, were meant for war in Vietnam, you know, in the city. That's all. Is that, is that, and, if I, and if you think that's out of line, then, you know, you're pretty strong about where you are. You know what I mean? So, I, so I, that's really what the song's about is like, you know, that choosing extremes is, is causing the, you know, the great divide and making our country weaker. In my opinion, it's not making it better. It's making it worse. So I sent it out to all the people I knew who were bitching and moaning. I sent them the song and that was my reply. And most people responded positively. A few people won't talk. You know, they reply, they, they just absolutely will not talk to you about that. that that's, how, that's how staunch they are on their point of view, you know? 
did music for you was it the uh, the precursor to acting or was uh, was it after you got started acting no i'll i'll link those two questions what we just were talking about in this together sort of do, uh, so no the answer is that it all started around the same time i started taking guitar lessons around the same time i started started taking uh acting lessons which is it was at 13 um I think I was much more goal oriented with being a professional actor though, than when I was being a professional musician, I just wanted to learn to write, uh, play guitar. And then when I started learning to play guitar, I started writing and that's what I really enjoy. I really enjoy the creative moment that happens when you write a song. It's very, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you know, you feel like the muse coming through you, they talk about, you know, uh, it's really cool when that happens. Um, and so that's really what, and it's also allowed me a way to express things that were going on in my life, frustrations or things that I was processing through putting it into song. It really helped me, uh, you know, grieve the process. So, and then obviously the acting career took off and I would, I was still sort of keep music going. I, my first band was, was uh, in LA was called the gathering an acoustic band that uh, while metal was going on, I was playing, we were, we were playing coffee houses, you know, so it was totally a <laughs> different, different vibe, you know, um, but, but to jump into this, to the, to the pandemic, um, it sort of put me in a, it put, it, it, it sort of did two things to me, realizing like life is short. You know, if you have something you want to do, you better get it done. And I've been talking about doing an acoustic record for a while. And I just kept kind of putting it off or not knowing how I was going to get it done. And having the more time on my hands, I started, you know, doing research and realized you can get a, a recording home system together now for like, really cheap. You just get this little box that you plug into your computer that gives you then a, a, um, a, a thing where you can track, you need two condenser mics and maybe a mic stand and you can track stuff at the com in the comfort of your own home. So that really started, so I started realizing like I have no excuses. So that started really getting me going there. And right at the same time that happened, um, my, my band ripple street, uh, the bass player had moved back, uh, back to the Southeast all of a sudden he came with some, some songs. Um, usually we did co-writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we, he brought in, he had a friend, he, he writes with this guy, Frankie Boggess, who also has a home studio, but actually knows how to engineer and, <laughs> and produce. So that took it to, you know, could mix, you know, mix and we could get a mastering. And so all of a sudden that became very accessible. I ended up doing a movie in North Carolina and showed up and, and tracked a couple of vocals and it went really well. And that's, and then I set up my studio. So now we're, we're making songs happen that way too. So, um, so what's happening right now is I have a record coming out that's coming out uh, called Acoustic Gains Volume One. Mm -hmm. We just put out our second sing. I just bought my second single, Cherish, last week. The third single is coming out on Monday the fifth, mm -hmm. um, uh, called Let It Ride, and that's a very bluesy, very vintage, very bluesy acoustic tune. With the band, we've put out three singles so far this year. Um, the, the the last one was called Would You, and it's the complete opposite of this mellow acoustic record I'm doing. I, I equate it to like a Black sabbath -y type vibe song. It's got that heavy vibe to it, um, and it's fun. And uh, we put out another song called Slab City, which is also a video, and then, like I said, a great device. We've got two more songs to go. I just finished doing my vocal tracks on those, so... We're on the mix. We're on the mix process now, and uh, once those two singles are out, then that will be an EP. So it's been a very creative time for me musically, and um, I'm enjoying the process. But it's been good for me to finally have no excuses to get off my ass and start putting out these some of these songs I've been sitting on for a long time. But I just, you know, finally I'm just like, let's just do them acoustically the way I wrote them. Let's just get them out, you know. So if folks want to keep up with uh, with the music, uh, the social media, and all that as well. Where's the best place to keep up with all of that? Sure. So the, you can, uh, for the music for Courtney Gaines and our ripple street, you can find us on Spotify for sure. And then you can, like I said, you can find us on Amazon and iTunes and Deezer, all that. If you want to see, hear some of our stuff. Also, you can you know, search us on YouTube. You'll find we've got a lot of videos up and things. Um, as far as me, Facebook is the best way to keep up with me. That's the stuff I post the most. And you just, you know, Courtney Gaines, you'll, there might be a couple of them, but the one is, you know, got all the current real stuff, you know, you'll know which one's me. And then I have an Instagram as well. And if you get need to school Courtney Gaines, you'll find me. Um, and that's it. I don't do Twitter. That's too much. That's, uh, those are my two ways to find me. Social media. I mean, who would have ever thought back when you started, Courtney, that 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 people would want to know everything you do every day. Right. Yeah, it's I, I think even conventions have also opened that door. I think that people have a lot more access to people 
than they used to. And I think it's a, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think on, on one hand, that's good. And I get where, and I get where people dig that. I think on the other hand, you know, it's, it can be too much. And I, 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 you know, I saw my son, like, you know, don't compare, don't compare yourself to people's highlight reel. Cause that's all a Facebook or anything. It, no one's talking about their, you know, no one's talking about the, <laughs> right. the their agonies of defeat as much as they're talking about, Hey, look at me, I'm in Cabo. You know, it's like, it's always about all the, the look at me looking good stuff, you know? So, um, but I, I like to have, you know, I like to be able to keep people up on what I'm doing, you know, uh, those who, those who are interested enough to find out. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, I, uh, I don't want, you know, I don't want people to know too, you know, too, too much about me. Right. I, I don't want, and what I mean, but I mean, that is just also as watching, the role just watch the if you know like i don't like i see somebody come on tv and they're english and now i've heard them do their english accent but they've been doing a great american accent or something now every time i see them i just think oh they're english though right like it like i don't want to know like i don't want to know i just want to watch them work so i'm you know I don't, i'm not that interested in people, people actors personal lives for the most part i because i just want to see their work and so that's sort of where i'm at too is like i don't want you to see too much i want you to just watch the work and get what you get from it hopefully it, in some ways it, you know you get touched, moved, or inspired. That's my job, right? There you go. You've done a you've done a great job for for an unbelievable amount of years, right, Courtney? Been blessed to be able to keep doing it this long. You know, uh, I mean, it's not totally a mistake. You know, I've worked, at, I've constantly worked at my craft and, and things like that, and I've tried to be smart about realizing what age I am and what roles are available, and it, you know, adjusting to being able to get those types of roles. I think when, you know, you start out as a child, you know, teenage actor, you, you know, it's not an easy transition. You know, I was, I, I, I mentally made sure that that happened. I didn't, once I was working, I didn't start taking for granted, like, Oh, I'll just have jobs forever. I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, you got to keep working at your, get good. You know, just keep getting better at what you do. You know, that'll take, and then things will take care of themselves. That's a good one right there. That's good advice right there from the mouth of Courtney Gaines. Yes, sir. <laughs> well courtney it has been great to visit with you today sir like i said been a fan of uh, so many of your movies over the years hope you have a, a happy fourth and uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon good that sounds good been a pleasure meeting you and uh, yeah talk to you soon then well this is unlucky 27 year old vincent marks lives in plaquemine louisiana near baton rouge and likes to pretend to be a cop. And earlier this month, he pulled someone over near New Orleans. Now his car had flashing lights, so the driver assumed it was a real cop and pulled into a parking lot. Then Vincent used his own car to block the guy in. He whipped out a fake badge and acted like a police officer. But it turned out he picked the wrong person to mess with because the driver happened to be a real cop who was off duty. The guy also recognized Vincent because they'd had a run-in before. He was involved in some sort of domestic dispute earlier this year. Now, it sounds like he took off when the real cop recognized him because it happened on June 10th and they just tracked him down on Monday. And he is facing charges for impersonating an officer. Final guest on the show today is a friend of the show and got a brand new single we're going to be talking about dropping tomorrow. His name is Bly, and uh, like I said, I call him a friend and family of the show as well. And first off, Bly, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show, brother. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Now, Bly, we've talked before, and uh, obviously, a new single out. You graduated high school. You're living life, and uh, how excited are you about the new single? And and uh, how long was this process? Oh man, this process was extensive. I've I have I've had this song sitting on it for about a year and a half. I've been wanting to record this song, but the um, I mean. Every, all the emotions I feel about this song, I feel like everyone who listens to it will feel the same way because it's it's just a great, it's a it's a hurt song almost. You know, it's it relates to people with Drunk Dial being the title. A lot of people have had that happen. So uh, I feel like this will be a good uh, connection song with some of my audience. Now, since we since we spoke last time, obviously lots has changed. You have you have signed. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that experience and and how excited you are going into the summer after graduation. 
Oh, so the Smith distribution group signing, that was that was amazing. I can't even put that into words. But we, we got there and he was like, Here, here's the pay, pen and paper. Sit down, let's do some let's do some uh photos and everything and I that was it. I mean, we just signed away and bam, I'm automatically signed to a distribution company. What? Are you kidding me? But uh yeah. What was the other question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, what it's like right now going into the summer after graduation, how uh, the signing and everything, how has that changed maybe your summer plans? So, so far, I think the signing hasn't changed any of my summer plans at all. But, uh, well, music wise, it has um, live shows. Um, we're doing lots of live shows this summer. So with the signing, that got me a lot of attention on the uh social media and so we're trying to use that as much as we can tagging smith music group and all that and so it's it's definitely started something that i didn't think would happen until much later but as far as like hanging out in summer goes i'm not sure but i'm gonna try to balance both (laughs) you got you got work to do right (laughs) yes i got a lot of work to do now, now tell us about the music this last year for you. Uh, this is something I love talking, especially with creators about, is how this last year has affected your music creation. So within this past year, I've actually gotten a lot done. I've had, uh, at this point, I think about 16 or 17 full songs written, and there's still many more unfinished ones. But just with this break and like of not doing anything and just – you know, all I can do is focus on my craft. All I can do is just hone in and try to make myself better and write more songs and get more connected with the music. Is I mean, I'm, I'm really blessed that that's happened, honestly. Now, how much do you have to rely on dad or, or how much do you kind of like scoff at dad when he tries to give you input? <laughs> um, he actually gives some pretty good input. I'm, 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 uh, on a lot of songs he's written, quite a few words that I was just stuck. And then he's come in and helped me just a couple words. And I'm like, Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, on the uh, gig side of it, he's very strong and he's very, very reliant because, you know, I'm just starting out and he has 30 plus years of experience in the music industry. So it's very, very helpful. Now, what has been the inspiration of late lyrically for you? I don't know. So, that's a hard that's a hard question for me to answer because my songwriting process is different for each song. I want to say because it usually starts out with a word that comes up in my head when I'm singing a melody, once I got the melody good. Then once that word pops in, my brain creates a story around one word or a couple words. The phrase that I want to drive into people's heads, like drunk dial, you know, uh, that's the main phrase. That's what the entire song's about. And so all the words and the verses and everything are tied together, making the story about this drunk dial. So that's just, that's my creative process. Now, do you subscribe to the fact of sitting down and uh, putting pen to paper each and every day? Do you have a set aside time that you do that? Or do you just do it when the inspiration hits you? As it comes, because my, my main uh, creative point, I guess, is when I'm like doing something, when I'm doing something that's just routine, like my main, <laughs> most of my songs come from when I'm uh, doing the dishes, really, <laughs> like that's, that's where it comes from, I mean, every time I'm doing dishes or, you know, something in routine, sweeping the floor like I usually do or something, that's whenever my engine gets going because I'm doing something that I'm already used to, so my brain's free you know, to just think. So now how much different is it as uh, looking in, at social media as an artist, a creator, how much does social media look different now as opposed to even six weeks ago? Right. Yeah. So it's actually changed a lot because I used to use social media just to have it, you know, just a regular Instagram page, Snapchat, TikTok, or whatever. But since we've tried to dive in more as, you know, musicians, it's, it's it's a little different because now I have to worry about promotion and putting money on a post and try to get it out places and make sure I don't put a typo in my captions, making sure I have the, <laughs> the right hashtag. And it's just a little bitty little things, it's just little things that kind of make me look at it a little differently, but it's, it makes it a little bit harder, but it's a lot more fun because the end results are outstanding. 
Sorry. And obviously your vision is affected too, because I, I know as you get into social media, you get into marketing and things like that, just walking down the street, you see things different, don't you? Yeah, definitely. I see a QR code and I'm like, man, what is that? What does that lead to or something? You know, I'm always thinking like that now. <laughs> Now, where is the single going to be available? Where's the best place for folks to to pick up Ooh, okay. drunk dial? I mean, I, I mean, obviously so, it's everywhere, right? Yeah, everywhere, everywhere on any music platform: Spotify, iTunes, Tumble. Is it Tumble? Yeah, Tumble. But uh, anything like that, any big. Uh, oh, Amazon Prime Music does it as well. So pretty much anywhere you can find drunk dial uh, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, another question. We talk social media. TikTok's blown up this last year. And as a new artist, I know you've got to be taking advantage of that. And what how, <laughs> how hard is TikTok as opposed to the others for you to learn? It's 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 very weird because it's not formatted like Facebook or Instagram. It has a, a real system instead of just like a post Mm-hmm. That you just back a video or whatever. So you have to swipe and there's different sounds you have to use. I'm never really like whenever Vine came out, it's kind of like the same thing. I never used Vine. And so it's like, you know, you use different sounds or whatever. And I looked up my uh, other song, Highs. It's a sound on uh, TikTok. So I've used that <laughs> a couple times. But uh, my TikTok <laughs> following isn't that strong, but it's getting there. It's, it's, it it's doesn't the t- baby steps. It doesn't take long. It doesn't yeah, take long. Yeah, it doesn't long. take long nowadays, yeah. Now, what are your goals social social media-wise? Do you have goals set up there? I mean, obviously, as an artist, you have goals for sales and for yeah. shows and stuff like that. Social media, is is that a big goal as well? Um, yeah, right now, we're trying to boost my following on uh, Instagram because uh, Facebook is where most of my following is. I have a lot more people on there. Mm, excuse me, but... Uh, yeah, right now I was just trying to get views, trying to get people to see what's out there because on the statistics that you post, like when you post a page and you promote it, you can see who's viewed it, where they viewed it, how many times, who saved it. You know, you can see all that stuff. And it's really interesting to see that people have shared this video and people have saved this video to their own Instagram library so they can look back at it. And that's really cool. So that's a whole new goal to try to get more and more people to get uh, – ready to do that and we're trying to get promotion for music videos that we're getting ready to shoot coming out later and then within the next couple months and those are just the main goals <laughs> now we're talking about the socials mm-hmm. why i gotta make sure and let everybody know each and every social you gotta let me know oh of course yeah so instagram is at just underscore bly snapchat is bly gomez Facebook is just Bly, or no, not just Bly, it's just the word Bly, and then (laughs) that's a little confusing, and then, uh, oh, TikTok is just underscore Bly as well. Well, uh, again, the new single, Drunk Dial, you can uh, pick it up tomorrow. You can also check out on the morning show. We will be debuting it uh, on the airwaves tomorrow morning at about 945, uh, on KQ106 and, uh, Bly, it is brother. It's always great to see you, man. I I'm so proud of everything you're doing. Can't wait to, uh, to continue to see the success and the growth, brother. Hey, thank you. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you again for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 100 second episode in season two of good questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, stickers, mugs, tumblers, and more, gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. And if you do have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, thanks again for our good friend Brandon Allen coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday. Thursday.